Derivative mode can be used when making sensible changes. The only caveat is that you need to make sure that you implement your control system properly so that you don't get that spike. But that doesn't mean that you cannot have derivative. I just said that the question said it should be used, but it should be used. Okay, so I can see why that's, that's uh, misinterpreted. Okay, fine. Cool. Let's try the next one. The next one's really easy. So the next question is asking. The integral load in a PID controller should not be used on noisy signals. It helps achieve offset free behavior and cannot be used for set point changes. change the tuning of the controller gain, KC, TI, or TD under those four cases. Which one is the most correct time when you change the controller tuning? You put that into your feedback controller, and those settings should work all the time, whether there's set point changes coming along or disturbance changes. The way we tune our controllers is so it works under most of the anticipated behavior we expect in our process. So if we expect frequent set point changes, you tune it for set point changes, but it should still work for disturbances. If a disturbance comes along, we, we cannot go change the tuning and then pick change it back again afterwards, right? Set for a set point change. We cannot change our tuning before a set point change and back after. Generally the tuning is set once and then left over there. Okay, so that's option C, which most people understood. Let's take a look at another one. The tuning rules, the CNCON tuning rules, can be used with options A, B, C, D over there. And what I just wanted to check uh, on your display is just make sure that this mathematics over here actually shows up. That's the interesting part of this particular quiz. Question that if your mathematics GP is 1 over S doesn't show up there, let us know so that we can take a look at it. It should show up on all devices, all phones, all tablets. It should show that quite nicely. Yeah, 
so there's the correct answer is most of you got that one. We need a first order plus time delay model to use those tuning rules. A few people answered C and D, where the model we have is a pure gain system. Okay, so if the model is a pure gain system, that says GP of this is equal to KP. That's a pure gain system. We cannot tune based on that. Right, the C and cone tuning rules require a first order plus time delay, so they require an E to the minus theta S. So we need that. It also won't work for an integrating process. An integrating process, 1 over s, we, have, we don't have a time constant tau. Tau is not equal to 1 in this case. Okay. The denominator must be of the form tau s plus 1. So the fact that you have an integrating process is not Okay, let's try the next question here. <coughs> What major criterion is the CA control tuning rule optimizing? This question is not multiple choice. So put in your best guess answer over here. This is a short answer question. There's um, two other criteria that also go with the CM function rule, but the major criteria that it focuses on is minimizing the IAE. Some of the other criteria are related to um, having manipulated variable movements that are not overly aggressive, but the main criteria is IAE. Let's take a look at another one here. Five tau rule, five times constants rule tells us that a system is stabilized can be used under which conditions? First order system, second order system, integrated processes, any system that has a tau in the, in the transfer function, or the last option E is for first or second order systems because both have tau. has tau squared s squared plus two tau psi s plus one in the denominator. First order system we, we know. So which under which conditions can we use the five tau rule? That's not strictly true. Remember, a second order system can have behavior, for example, that does this. Okay. The tau in the second order transfer function doesn't tell you 
how fast it settles down. So the five tower law cannot be used for second order systems or other transfer functions that happen to have a tower. Only for first order systems uh, is that rule true. Okay? So the first order response, which behaves in the usual way that stabilizes like that. Okay? Because that's 99% of the response achieved in five time constants. But the critical point here is you must be sure that the system you're dealing with is first order. And fortunately, most engineering, chemical engineering systems, that's a fairly reasonable assumption. Okay, so let's try one final one. <clears throat> the statement, all processes experiences, experience disturbances is not true or generally true. system that the guys have created here is that it's supposed to obviously simulate a clicker system without having to buy a clicker. So that's the key, one of the key objectives with designing the system. The other key objective that they had in mind with this system was that unlike clicker questions which disappear after you've left the class, this system you'll actually have access to the questions permanently with the full answers. Okay, so you'll be able to log in later on and see all these questions and answers. The only thing is because it's on a temporary server here, the correct server that it will be on later on is not there right now, but after today it will be there. It is called inpress.macmaster.c. Okay, so we'll be able to access all these questions in the future from that permanent server. Uh, it's just temporarily on my, my server here this week. Okay, so, yes. Um, this is not question. Um, do you have to use the McMaster server? Do you have to use the McMaster server to access it? Um, so right now it's passes on the external network. So you can use it outside, but I think the impress is internal. Impress is internal, yeah. It's just temporary just to try it out. What do you guys think of it? Any feedback for them? Do you guys like it? Okay. 
Okay. Yeah. I'm gonna. I have to change the settings so you can see the answers. Yeah, I haven't set that setting. No, but like even though Okay. Oh, your once you've answered on your machine, you yeah, want to see the settings. Oh, I see. Okay, so yeah, that's one thing. If they go previous questions, they want to see their answers. That they answer. Okay, that's a great, that's a question. Anything else for them as feedback? Feedback control. <laughs> okay, thanks, guys. If you want to try on the cascade control and feed forward. Yeah. 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 Uh, so <coughs> so if you go back to the page, just refresh it, uh, go back to my courses, click on post control, and you'll see a second quiz show up on cascade control. Yeah, you guys see it now? So go back to the line courses over here at the top of the page. Click on courses, control forms. And if you refresh it now, refresh that page, you should see a second option show up for Cascade. Nothing we can add to any system. B, we only need a new sensor. C, a new sensor, a new controller. D, a sensor, a manipulated variable. And option E, a sensor, manipulated variable, and a controller. If we're adding cascade control to the existing process, what more do we need to buy or add? So the reality is in most 
quantity fines, so the cost of a controller is $0. Yeah. It's simply incremental addition to an existing computer that you already have. So you just add a new loop of software to the machine. The cost is just the time of the person to add that loop and, and add it to the existing database of control systems. So good companies that practice control systems properly will have a database of controllers and the settings for those controllers so they can recover from any uh, loss of memory. They can recreate their control systems. Okay. So cascade control primary variable appears in which loop? Uh, let's take a look at the answer. Most people said the other loop, which is correct. Okay, next question then asks, tuning the cascade controller so recall tuning the cascade controller for those two groups. Do we need to do one process reaction curve experiment? Two reaction curve experiments. The first one is to step the manipulated variable. Or option C, to do two reaction curve experiments. The first is to step the set point for the inner loop. Afterwards, the inner loop is tuned first. You get that stabilized with its feedback controller. In other words, you need a model of the manipulated variable to the controlled variable. Then you stabilize that, then you do your outer loop. The outer loop input is the set point. So then you step the set point to the inner loop, measure the response, and then. So that's cascade control. Let's, uh, let's do the feed forward questions. But that's what you step on the second reaction curve experiment. So you step the, the manipulated variable is what you step for the inner loop. The same point is what you step for the outer loop. Right. Always do the inside first. Yeah, when, and that's 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 the set point to the inner loop is adjusted by the outer loop. The outer loop is adjusted the set point. Okay, let's uh, if you refresh, you'll see feed forward control. Everyone got feed forward control? Let's go back to my courses, process control, refresh that, and you'll see a third quiz show up. Then this will be our last quiz, we can quickly finish this up. Okay, successful feed forward control requires a cause and effect relationship. From the disturbance to the valve. So remember feed forward control is all about the disturbance. Do we need a cause and effect relationship from that disturbance to the valve? <coughs> From the valve to the disturbance, from the control variable to the valve, or from the disturbance to the control variable. This one's a bit of a messy one to answer unless you have a picture of the control system. So if you can think through that again.
where's the cause and effect relationships? There's the first one, from the disturbance to the valve. Does feed forward require cause and effect relationship from the disturbance to the valve? No. We don't want that causal relationship. From the valve to the disturbance. If you change this valve, you want the disturbance to change. Definitely not, right? The third option, from the controlled variable to the valve. That's a little bit backwards, right? Here's my controlled variable to the valve. That's opposite. Okay, so the only other option remaining, option B, from the disturbance to the controlled variable. So if you make a change here in this disturbance, you'll see some sort of change in the control. <coughs> so the correct answer there is the final one. You can see what people answered. Mostly that one. Okay. Good. So let's take the next question then for feed forward. It asks a properly defined feed forward controller can be added to any feedback controller if you don't need to do any extra work. To be added to a feedback controller, but we first need to retune the PID. Okay, so remember, here's my feedback controller existing already. I've got my set points. I've got my GC. So that PID controller, do I need to go retune that PID controller? I can add feed forward to any feedback controller, but we must first check that the system is still stable. And option D can be added to any feedback controller that still check that set point changes work okay afterwards. so that nothing changes in CV. And if nothing has changed in CV, there's no need to go do any work here on GC. And even if you've added a feed forward controller that's not perfect, you don't need to go retune the controller. Because you don't change stability of the system at all. Okay. We don't need to go check option D that set point changes will still work. Set point changes will work because we still have our feedback loop. We haven't altered that loop. So option A, add, it to feed, back, add to the feedback controller, no extra work is required. Simply add it in, and that's it. And your work's done. So option A is the most correct one. Let's take a look at the, one final question regarding feed forward. So we have two significant and regularly occurring disturbances on the process. What can we do regarding the forward? Take a look at those five options. Four options. Let us disturb. 
disturbance one, perhaps let's add disturbance two down here. We've got two disturbances. Take a look. What people are saying. Okay, B and C seem to be the most frequently answered options. Answer C is the correct one. Okay. When we're applying feed forward control, we don't. We're not limited to a single disturbance. I could add the transfer function GFF two here. GFF2, and GFF2 makes an additional change to that valve to counteract GD2. GFF1 makes a change to the valve to counteract the first disturbance. We don't need to find another manipulated variable to do that one. Yes, Tuning would just be a higher part, right? To be able to make sure there's no disturbances. No, it's a proper Okay, tuning would be a problem. What's, what's the sentiment regarding tuning? What do people feel about tuning in this case? How difficult is your tuning task compared to a single disturbance? Think back to the question two before this one. What additional work do you have to do to try to control? Nothing, really. really, right? So we can add the second feed forward controller on. Just need to calculate GFF2. GFF2 is going to be equal to minus GD2 over GP. And GFF1 is equal to minus GD1 over GP. So once you know the, the disturbance transfer function, the process transfer function, and this disturbance transfer function, you can calculate that. The tuning here in GC is not changed. Does that make sense? Okay. So tuning is no different on feed forward. Okay, that's the nice. That's why uh, I emphasize that question in the tutorial. That you prove to yourself that disturbances have no impact on. Sorry, feed forward controller has no impact on the stability of the process. So finding GD two would that be difficult? Finding GD two. Finding GD in general is difficult, so it's no harder than, than the work you would have had originally. So finding the disturbance transfer function is hard because disturbances by definition are not under your control. Okay, so that's a, that's a nice recap of the material we've covered over the past three, four weeks. If there's any shortcomings on that, make sure you're clear on where your misunderstandings lie, and I'll make sure that these quizzes get posted for you um, at least by Monday. I'll try to get it, get the guys to get it up and running through by today. Let's go back then to our notes on the relative gain of And you have the notes there in front of you from last time, or the spare copies up here in front. <coughs> section of the course is we're recognizing that when we've got two control systems working with each other or working on a process, we can have interaction between them. We spent significant time the last two classes 
looking at these interactions, and the interactions come through because G21 and G12 are non-zero. So on processes where we have those transfer functions non-zero, the first manipulated variable, MV1, will not only impact CV1, but MV1 will also impact CV2. Conversely, the second manipulated variable, MV2, may have an impact on the first control variable. Okay, and when we have that interaction between the loops, two things are problematic. The first is selecting which manipulated variable and controlled variable to pair with each other is a problem, and that's what we're focused on. The second problem is tuning these loops is also a problem. <coughs> we introduced a way last class to help tell us which loops to pair with each other. So which manipulated variable should go with which control variable. And the metric we use is this number called lambda. Lambda ij tells me the relationship between the output j and the input i. And what we do is, as we, just, we spoke of last time, is we form a ratio of two numbers. This ratio tells me the difference in the gain when I make an open loop change versus a closed loop change. Let's take a look at the numerator again. This numerator says, make a change in the manipulated variable j. So, do I have this wrong? Yes, I have this wrong. So, make a change in the manipulated variable j. So, Let's take a look at the case where j is equal to 1, that first manipulated variable up there. Make a change in that first manipulated variable and observe the output on CB. Okay. So what that does is essentially it calculates the gain. Remember, we're only interested in the gain here in G11. Now I'll take a look at the following situation. Let me go back to a diagram we looked at earlier. This, one, this diagram is in the textbook at figure 20.7. You don't have it here in the notes, but we've looked at this in class before. Let's take a look at when I make a change in MV1. <coughs> MV1 not only impacts CV1, but it will also have an impact on CV2. But let's take a look at how that happens. And what I'm, what, what, the reason why I'm considering is that this is because I'm looking at this denominator term. Let's just quickly translate in words what this mathematical expression is. It says, find me the change in CVI. So remember, I'm considering control variable 1. Right now, CV1 is what I'm considering. Divided by MVJ. I'm considering at the moment MV1 as well. Right now, that's my consideration. We already looked at the numerator. Now I want to try and understand what this denominator is. For the case when i is 1 and j is 1, it says, what is the output 1 going to do when I change the input 1? But the difference is, in the denominator, all the other loops are closed. So we know what the output is going to do, 1 is going to do if I change the input 1 when all the loops are open. We're simply just going to measure the gain G11. That's all we're going to get from that numerator. That gets me my open loop gain. Okay. But the denominator is not going to be the same. What's going to happen on CV1 when I change MV1 in closed loop may be different, and here's why it could be different. If I change MV1, then propagate down through here, through G21, comes into this control loop, affects CV2, which will feed back, and CV2 starts to change this manipulated variable, MV2 changes. Because that manipulated variable, MV2 changes, it comes through here, G12, and affects CV1. So CV1's change, when I change MV1, <coughs> may be quite different in closed loop versus open loop. Take a look at what happens if G21 were 0. 
the G21 was zero, this signal comes down and it stops right there. It doesn't go any further. So then your change in CV1, the change in MV1, is the same whether the system were an open loop or a closed loop. In other words, this gain that you get here in the denominator is the same as the gain you get in the numerator, which implies that your lambda is equal to 1. That's the best case. Right? The best case is that there's no interaction because as you come down here, it simply kills the signal right there with the zero. What if this was non-zero? There's another way in which we could stop this interaction. If this was non-zero, it still travels through here, comes around through GC2, comes into here. What if G12 was zero? It will still kill the signal and still mean that CV1 is not effective. Okay? So you can get no interaction if G21 or G12 is zero. It doesn't need to be both, it doesn't need to be and. We can get no interaction if G12 or G21 are zero, then you'll get no interaction. Okay? In other words, your numerator gain in open loop will be the same as your denominator gain with closed loop. Mm -hmm. okay, so that's our key result from this lambda. This lambda is an element then that we use to decide when to pair. And we like to pair i and j's. So you choose your manipulated variable i with controlled variable j when lambda is close to 1, or as close to 1 as you possibly can get it. Okay, if lambda i j was zero, would that be a useful pairing? How do you get a zero here? No, 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 no. G11 would be zero. It says that if you manipulate this variable, that control variable doesn't move. So there's no point, right? It would be like me trying to change the temperature in this room by adjusting the sound of the speaker system. Right? There's no gain in that. This gain is zero. It's a useless manipulated variable to pair with that control variable. So lambda zero is not useful. Lambda one is the ideal case. Okay? Now what about negative lambdas? What if lambda ij was negative? that telling me? It's telling me my open loop gain has a different sign to my closed loop gain. Maybe the open loop gain is, is positive, the denominator is negative, so I get a negative lambda ij, or vice versa. It still tells you there's a cause and effect relationship between i and j, but you're playing a dangerous game when you're pairing on a negative. The reason why you're playing a dangerous game is because it says that this game in the open loop case is different when you're in closed loop. It's telling you that your system's sign of behavior changes when you've got the loops closed versus the loops open. Now that's not a bad thing, because the loops are normally closed, and you can go change the sign of your controller's gain to match that gain. But never believe that the loops always remain closed. Control systems fail. And if a control system fails, that means the loop opens up. Okay? And then you suddenly have a case where your gain switches on you, your other feedback controllers are still active, and you can create an unstable result. Okay. So we never pair, or we try to avoid pairing on negative lambdas because it's telling you your process is going to switch sign on you if something goes wrong. Right. And we don't like that instant. We don't like the risk of instability. Okay. So we looked at this a little bit last class. We looked at it in today's class. You'll see it in the tutorial today for those that have tutorial, and there's and there's a question on the assignment as well on how to pair. Uh, and we'll look at it a little bit more on Monday's class just to wrap up some moments you can see. Monday's class is mostly a review and there's no tutorial on Monday. But